So I'm here today with Harry, and he's about to share his story of waking up from the witnesses. And I have not heard anything about this, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so far, he seems like a really awesome guy. So, Harry, go ahead and introduce yourself and take it away. Hi. Yeah, I'm Harry. And um, to kind of give you my story, some of the things that I've experienced um, being a lifelong witness. So basically, my parents got um, baptized in 1970, so I would have been about five and a half. So I remember maybe one Christmas, one birthday, one Halloween. But otherwise, I was raised in the 70s and 80s as, as a normal witness child. Um, and it wasn't a bad life. We were um, very hospitable in the congregation, so we had a lot of friends over. And I always had friends. I know you know, it was field service on Saturday morning was mandatory, never missed a meeting. Um, my dad was a ministerial servant. That was the extent of his progress throughout the years. But um, yeah, so then basically everything was going good until um, basically when I, so I was really bought into the um, generation ending and, every, and all my con friends and respected elders that I hung out with we're all like, oh, you know, I was to graduate in 1983, and they're like, well, you know, you're you're probably just going to graduate, and the end's going to come because of the generation that's seen 1914. So I really bought into that. So I never gave any any thought to furthering my education. Never took interest in any certain particular subject that I was going to be like, oh, that's what I'm going to do to provide for my family. So I was just, you know, I I graduated, and then. Um, and then the, I always hung out with uh, witnesses and um, yeah, before I graduated, like in my early mid teens, some of the trouble I got into that um, was wrong was always with witnesses and my parents were pretty lenient. I got to go to like school dances and homecoming and um, things like that. So I did hang out with, with worldly kids, never got in trouble with them. But so my extended family, like my aunt and uncle, they they lived in a different in a bigger city. So I would go hang with them and you know, their witnesses. My uncle was an elder and they would set me up with um other young, young, fine, outstanding brothers in the congregation. And did they be smoking hash, you know, and be like, oh, you know, I remember they asking me, maybe that was a term in the early 80s, are you red? And I'm like, well, what do you mean are you red? And so then they whip out a hash pipe and so, I mean, they did stuff like that. Of course, you know, I joined them because I didn't want to look stupid. But um, so that was some of the trouble. And then, um, so all the guys would be in this big hot tub and these young sisters would come around to the guys and basically, without going into too much detail, there was a lot of improper touching under the water. And these were all witnesses, you know, and there would be, you know, just a, a whole crew of witnesses there. And, I remember going to school and telling my worldly buddies the stuff that would happen at our circuit assemblies. And they were like, wow, man, that's cool. You know? <laughs> but I don't know. It just kind of shows the, you know, the hypocrisy, I guess. But, you know, young people are young people and they'll do what they're going to do. But um, it was just, a, it, was, it was, it's always been a thing when they always would say the scripture, you know, do not be misled, bad association, spoil useful habits. And they would, counsel you know oh, don't hang out with the world because they're going to spoil your habits well in my case it, it wasn't the world because when you're with the world it's it's black and white you know what's right you know what's wrong but when you're with other witnesses when you're with other pioneers or children of elders you know then all of a sudden that black and white turns to gray and it's like well wait a minute you know these kids are well respected in the congregation and they're doing all this stuff so but yeah so that was about you know i never really gotten trouble at that point for any of that stuff that I did and it wasn't until 1983 when I graduated and then um, an elder friend talked me into regular pioneering so I signed up to regular pioneer in September 83 and that was going all right but there was still always trouble to get into somehow I found it and amongst other pioneers and um, yeah one time a group of us that were we were pioneers and, and fine young brothers. We went to another brother's house and we were drinking and um, 
nobody really did anything wrong other than getting drunk. But what happened was this, this brother that lived there, he wasn't home, but we were just using his apartment and a mirror got broken and he got mad and he went to the elders with it. And so basically in, in March of 84, then we had our circuit overseers visit. And at that time I was going to apply for Bethel because that was the thing when every young brother did when they got raised in the truth is you go to Bethel. So I went to the circuit overseer and I said, Hey, can I get an application for Bethel? And he said, well, we went, we're out in service in the morning. And he says to the car group, Oh, he says, me and uh, Harry, we're going to take a walk around the block. So I walked around the block with the circuit overseer and he told me that, um, they were going to meet with, they wanted to meet with me about this drunken party with all these witnesses. And so, so then on that Saturday night, I had to go, you know, basically they set up a judicial committee meeting, like right away, because what I learned is when you, when you're a pioneer, I mean, you're looked up to more. And so they, you know, they wanted to get to the bottom of that right away. So I went there with my parents. And so then they're asking me all these detailed questions and the circuit overseer was in on the meeting. And then they also had some, other elders from other congregations come there because, you know, my family was so close with the congregation. They had actually brought one of the elders into the truth and stuff. So they probably, they didn't want, you know, them to look at me and, and not be hard on me. So um, anyways, so yeah, that night, then they disfellowship me. And, um, you know, I was still a virgin. I was basically, you know, once, once they started going in the details, like what they said, they knew, you know, I just kind of threw everybody under the bus and I'm like, okay, if I'm going down, everybody else is too. So I just spewed out all the names of all the people that were with me, you know, and all the things we did. I think one time, yeah, me and another pioneer brother, we went to like a strip club, you know, and so I told his name and I mean, like, okay, I'm going to get my conscience clean and I'm just going to tell everything. <laughs> and so yeah, that was it was hard to do, especially when your parents are sitting there, you know, in the same room. But I'm like, so then uh what was interesting is so that was the week of the circuit overseer's visit. So then I had to go to the meeting on that Sunday. So technically I was his fellowship, but they weren't going to announce it till the following Thursday night. So I said to the circuit overseer, I said, So now tomorrow when I go to the meeting, I says, I'm I'm this fellowship, right? And he goes, Yep. I said, So what what happens when people come up and want to talk to me? He says, you just look at him and you tell him there's going to be an announcement made Thursday night. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, so I walk into Kingdom Hall and, you know, I'm, I'm a happy, go lucky, fun guy to be around. And, I, you know, and everybody could tell by my demeanor that something was wrong. So, you know, good friends and elders, they're coming up to me. You know, we should go out for lunch after the meeting. And I just look at him. I go, there's going to be an announcement made Thursday night. And they would just instantly just turn and walk away. And so then I went and I even went and sat down to not be as approachable. And this one brother comes up to me and uh, he's of the anointed now, but he opens up his Bible and he's want to share the scripture with you. And I look at him and I said, there's going to be an announcement made Thursday night. And he just slams his Bible shut and turns and walk, walks away. So that was just the weirdest thing ever. But um, so then anyways, then that was that day, you know, I listened to the talk really good and everything. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get reinstated. My conscience is clean and everything. And then throughout the day, it just dawned on me. It's like, you know, all these years I've been hiding things that I've been doing wrong and not worried about getting get caught. Now I can do what I want. I can't get in any more trouble. I'm just fellowship. People think I'm scum, you know, everybody who I've ever been with my entire life can't talk to me. So that follow that that following Monday, and because it was still relatively soon after graduation, like you know, less than a year, there was still a lot of my friends from school were still around in the town. So I just started hanging out with them and going to the bars and stuff that week. And um, because that was you know, drinking age was 18, so I, I could legally drink and everything. I had I think I was I had I was 19 at the time, but um so anyways, yeah, you want to be the most popular guy in a bar, you just tell them that you're kicked out of Jehovah's Witnesses and, you know, and you tell them that your parents can't do anything with you and your friends. And it's just like, man, people, people are like buying you drinks and, you know, <laughs> but uh, so basically that week, then my, my dad says, you know, if you're not going to live according to the rules of, a, of the house, you're going to have to move out. So I had no place to go. And I was only working like part time because I was a pioneer for the year before that. 
What's interesting is that on the day that I got this fellowship, I went out in service that morning. I had 666 hours that day. <laughs> that was when you had to have 90 hours a month. <laughs> the irony. <laughs> kind of ironic. <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> so I got kicked out and I went and moved in with another family who were witnesses, but the dad was this fellowship and the mom was kind of like, inactive you know and they had a son a couple years younger than me and he was a partier and so I, I I went moved in with them briefly until I could get a job and then moved in with um the guy whose dad owned like a store that that I worked at so so then I was this fellowship for a year and I basically you know sowed my wild oats like they say tried everything I could in the world I still believed it was the truth I just thought that the standards were just too too strict for me, you know, and I thought at the time being disfellowshipped that it would take a long time of going to meetings to get reinstated. Well, you know, then I then I would hear like from my mom, she would say, "Oh, you know, these different ones that I kind of threw under the bus, so to speak." Within three four months, they're reinstated, and I'm like, because my mom was like, "Yeah, you could be you could be reinstated by the by the district convention or whatever," and I'm like, "Oh man, I thought it'd be a lot longer than that." And my parents were pretty strict. I mean, they didn't converse with me unless they absolutely had to. So, but she would just throw a few things out there just to maybe try to encourage me. But um, anyways, so that's how that happened. But uh, so I had a worldly girlfriend and we were pretty, pretty close. And I explained to her the whole disfellowshipping thing and where we were at. And then um, I don't know, one day I'm just like, you know what? It would make my parents proud and my friends I'm just going to get reinstated. So I called one of the elders and I told them, of course, he was so happy. He was like crying on the phone. And I, so I started going back to meetings and then of course, being, I had the worldly girlfriend, his elder said, well, you know, you have to, you can't be dating a worldly girlfriend and get reinstated. So I had to break up with her, which was very difficult, but she was curious about religion. She was raised Catholic, very strict Catholic. And so she started studying with my mom so my mom studied with her and so she would be at the house you know and I would come home from work or whatever and she'd be there but technically we weren't supposed to be boyfriend girlfriend but I knew she still loved me and I had feelings toward her but um yeah so then I think I went to meetings probably four months you know and I was reinstated it didn't take long and um because I know I was reinstated by you know it was probably like April or March, April of 85. And I was reinstated by the, by the district convention, which was usually in July. So, um, so anyways, yeah. So then there was another, another young sister who liked me. So she was hanging out with me at the, at the convention. And so then my girlfriend went, went to all three days of the convention. And um, then she seen me with this other girl because technically I couldn't be girlfriend boyfriend girlfriend with her and so that kind of upset her she still continued to study for a little bit but then she just she stopped studying so then that was the last really I heard of her but um so yeah I was reinstated and everything was good and um I actually moved to Hawaii and then I um I was only there six months and then I had a girlfriend back here in where I live and so we were writing back and forth so I thought she wanted to get more serious. So I moved back. Um, but otherwise in Hawaii, yeah, I mean, being a witness, that was okay because, we, you know, you move there. I mean, I knew a family that had moved there. That's how I got set up there. But um, everybody was was pretty good, you know, in the congregation. It was hard to go out in field service because you had to put on pants. And who wants to wear pants when it's 85 degrees? <laughs> <laughs> it's Hawaii for crying out loud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that went good and then came back and then, um, so came back in 86 and then uh, the girl that liked me, she didn't like me anymore. So then I ended up um, dating my wife who I have now, I've been married almost 37 years. And so she, my wife was a couple, had just gotten out of high school and I had known her and her family you know, since we were little kids, actually, her brother was one of them that I partied with, who I threw under the bus, and he got this fellowship at the same time as me, but he got reinstated. He didn't go out in the world at that time. So what happened then with, with my wife and I is, um, yeah, we ended up fooling around, make a long story short, 
she got pregnant while we were engaged. So we're both witnesses. And uh, we had a wedding plan the following April of 87. And so she basically, you know, I, she's pregnant and she, we knew that she couldn't, we couldn't go through with the wedding because she'd be showing big time. <laughs> But I just kept putting it off. I'm like, oh, man, I knew it was just going to be just the worst thing ever. You know, I mean, when parents found out her parents and, then, you know, and what was interesting is we both worked at the same place for a brother who had all his employees were all witnesses. And my wife's grandpa worked there. He was a witness. My wife's brother worked there. He's a witness. And his um, family, you know, that from his wife worked there. And it was like crazy. It was probably like 20 people there at this small woodworking shop. So anyway, so what happened was, as I was drinking one night with, with my wife's oldest brother, and I told him about his sister being pregnant, and I thought he'd be cool with it, and he ran and told his mom, yeah, and then all hell broke loose. <laughs> Bunch of tattletales. I know, yeah, exactly. Like you ratted me out. But I mean, it, it hadn't been told. I mean, it's just like, somebody's got to tell, and I'm like, a, and but yeah, that did not go over well. So... My wife and I, we went to one of the elders and so we were both in separate congregations at the time. So we went to the elder and her congregation told him. And so then, uh, so we basically, we basically had the wedding all set up. We had the invitation set out. My wife actually had a wedding shower. Um, I had the, the brothers that were going to stand up in the wedding. all had their tux fitted. She had the sisters, uh, their dresses fitted. I mean, it was... So this was in February and the wedding was going to be in April. So it was getting down there. So it was like, we had a lot of crap to cancel and yeah, it was just, it was a bad, bad chapter in my life. But um, yeah. So what happened was, is, is on the day that we got married, we had to, we had to both meet with the elders, you know, for the judi judicial meeting. So I met with the elders in my congregation. She met with three elders from her congregation. We both had the meeting at the same time. They went in one room, we went in the other room. And um, what was interesting is on the judicial meeting, one of the elders was the owner of the company that we worked at. <laughs> so when, you know, and I knew it was a no brainer, we were gonna get this fellowship. It was like, they didn't even really need to, you know, meet with me. They just said, boom, you guys are done. But you know, they got to go through the whole rigmarole and share scriptures with you and blah, blah, blah. So I listened and she listened. And so then I said, when, when they decided that I was disfellowshipped, I said to this elder, I said, I said, well, and this was on a Friday. And I said, um, well, I'm, you know, I got to come to work on Monday. And uh, I said, so do I still have a job? And he looked at me and he says, well, I can't bury you for being disfellowshipped. And I'm like, well, that's good. You know, here I am, I'm getting married. I got a wife that's going to have a baby. You know, and she she could still work. So he's, you know, he said she could still work there too. So we both go to work on that Monday. And of course, um, none of it really had been announced, you know, but um, I think just the secret got out because they really don't announce it to the following week. But uh, so everybody kind of treated us kind of coolly. And then when we, um, we would take our lunch break, you know, of course they can't eat with you. So then we would, and this was like in February, so it's cold up, but we would go out in, our, in the car. So yeah, what happened was after that judicial meeting, my wife and I went to the courthouse and got married and we moved into apartment right away. Um, so we were married. So our anniversary day is always the day that we got this fellowship. <laughs> 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 yeah, so that was a long day. But uh, so uh, anyways, what's, what's interesting with this part of the story is I think I worked there maybe three, four days and one day, and, and during this time, Brother Lett, Stephen Lett was our circuit overseer. Oh, and, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. I actually had gone out in field service with him before I got this fellowship and everything. So any uh, interesting stories with him? Um, well, I remember the very first time he stood up on stage and he looked out at the audience and he was doing all these crazy facial expressions without even saying a word. His eyebrows are going up and down and he's smiling and, you know, raising his eyebrows up really high. And I remember thinking man, what's wrong with this guy? Is he having like a seizure or something? You know, it was just like weird. But uh, no, otherwise, I mean, he was a pretty normal guy out in service and stuff. We took breaks and everything. And I mean, I remember it was the first person I ever knew was of the anointed. And I'm like, oh, wow, man, this guy, he's he's pretty high up. You know, he's he's of the 144,000 and blah, blah, blah. And I remember going to the door with them and he started his presentation and the lady just shut him down right away. And I remember thinking, man, she has no idea who she's shutting down, you know? <laughs> 
but what happened was is so so brother let um told these elders in the congregation that had this fellowship me that I shouldn't be working there so they so the the owner of the company who was an elder and then the another brother an elder come to work with their bibles in their hand and I'm like oh this ain't looking good and he says says Harry you know want to come with us in the break room so I go sit with him in the break room so they give me this whole spiel that they met with brother Lett and that that he needs you know being he's the owner of the company he can do what he wants and, and the, you know he shouldn't have the fellowship people working there so basically he fired me and uh I remember looking at him and I said I said so what's going to happen now when I go to another job and they ask me okay you've been working at this place for this length of time now you no longer work there what happened I said how's that going to look when I tell him that it was for religious reasons I said you know that's that's illegal and he looks at me real stern and he says you do that and I'll just say I fired you because I didn't like you <laughs> that's still illegal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget those words out of his mouth. And I'm just like, okay, whatever. So I end up finding another job right away. And uh, um, and I think that the job that I found right away, I, I didn't say anything about the religious part of it or whatever. You know, I just kind of kept that hush hush. And they actually let my wife work there until she really couldn't work there anymore, even though she was a fellowship too, but she got to stay working there until you know she had to stop to have our our child but um but then i remember another job the the human resource guy he he asked me he goes well you worked at this place you know what happened and so by that time um i think i was reinstated and everything and so i i told him what happened and he's like well you know he says that that's illegal and he says you could you could get this guy in trouble and blah 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 and i'm like yeah i know i said i'm just it's just water over the dam just let it go but he was he was quite puzzled by that whole scenario but uh so yeah so basically when uh when we got married and we both just came to well went to every single meeting we're like we're gonna get reinstated we wanted to be with their family and everything and she wanted to be with her family because she has a big family and at the time they were all witnesses and so um yeah we went to meetings for about 15 months you know over a year because we, I think we got reinstated in May of um, 88. And uh, so, yeah, that was what was interesting with the, with all that then is um, the elders that were meeting with us to get reinstated, they said, well, you know, he says, the congregation has to forgive you. It's not just, it's not just Jehovah. It's not just us. The congregation has to forgive you. And, and you, you guys were dishonest by having that baby sh or the wedding shower um, and you got all them gifts. Now, some people might be holding that against you. So you, what you need to do is contact all them people. I'm serious. All them people that gave you gifts and ask them if they want the gifts back or the monetary value of what they're worth. You lied. <laughs> this um, is ridiculous. Yep. Yeah. Where's, where's that in the Bible? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> same places where the governing body is in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so anyways, so uh, we're like, well, so we had to figure out how to get, well, actually the elders did it. They, they got the, the addresses of all the ones. We, we tried to remember who all gave us gifts. Because I mean, this had been quite some time had passed, you know. I mean, and as far as the gifts, we either had used it or whatever. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't really returnable. I mean, here you want this toaster back or whatever. But, um, and we didn't have any money. We were like super poor, you know. And so, like, how the heck are we going to get the money, you know, to pay these people back? What if they want the money back? What are we going to do? And we're just like, oh, no. And this is, this is, this is hinges on us getting reinstated. And it's like, ay, ay, ay. So it basically, we wrote everybody letters explain to them what the elders had told us. Then, the, then they would return the letters back to the elders and then the elders would meet with us. So we met with the elders and they said, well, we're going to let you know, you know, what the, what the response was from the friends. And then I remember the one elder saying overwhelmingly, they just want you guys reinstated. They could care less about the money or the gifts or anything. My wife and I, we were so relieved. We're like, Phew, wow. <laughs> Cause at the time I think we had, uh, yeah, we had our little baby, you know? And so, you know, he was just a little bitty guy. And so um, we'd bring him to all the meetings, you know, and, and uh, my wife's grandparents were there. And so my grand, her, 
my wife's grandma would take our baby and then that way other people could you know look at the baby otherwise if they would approach us you know i mean that was a no-no because i mean there was a real buttoned up congregation everybody was super strict with all that stuff but uh yeah so we got reinstated and basically we just we raised our family as, as witnesses and um it, it wasn't bad um then what happened was um when our our youngest i'm trying to think if there's anything that happened that was really puzzling I, i'm probably forgetting some things but uh um yeah anyway so then what happened was uh i ended up got, i ended up being a ministerial servant and um my wife and i we always worked shift work so we would miss some meetings and we had a circuit overseer that was real strict about never missing meetings and so what happened was is then we um we would do shift trades or we'd use all our vacation to try to get to all the meetings so once we started getting the meetings and then we started going out in field service more, we were getting like 16 to 20 hours a month out in field service. And then all of a sudden they wanted to be me to be a servant, which I was okay with that. And um, our kids, you know, we had three children. They were all going out in service like they're supposed to. And our, um, our oldest son, he got baptized at 14. Our youngest daughter got baptized at four, 14, I think she was. And we never pressured our kids to get baptized at all we just left them all up to them and then our other our middle daughter she waited until she was like 20 22 i think and she got baptized but um so what happened was is our youngest daughter um got in some trouble she on our family camping trips and she at that time she was an unbaptized publisher and she um was fooling around with her cousin sexually and so she told her friend about it and her friend said i'm going to go to the elders unless you guys go to the elders first so we ended up going telling go to the elders so they met with us and so they basically they announced her as no longer being an unbaptized publisher and because of that i had to step down from being, uh, being a ministerial servant so um and then so that after that you know i think i was a servant for probably three and a half years or so um never had to give any public talks or anything like that just did like conducting, you know, book study, filling in and, you know, some of the talks and announcements and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so then um, she ended up getting in trouble more after she got baptized. And then we went on a family vacation, but she, she stayed home. And basically it was just my wife and I and our, our middle daughter. And, and then here, our, our youngest daughter had a boyfriend from a different congregation. He technically wasn't baptized, but he was going to all the meetings and everything. And we knew that he liked her at the time. So she would have been 16 and he would come over to the house and hang out like with our oldest son. And then they would, you know, be boyfriend, girlfriend, but we watched them pretty close. But what happened was, is when we were gone on vacation and our son had a work, he came over and was hanging out with her, unchaperoned for a good four hours from what I heard. So I think she might've told her friend and it was one of them deals. So being she was baptized, it was more serious. So um, yeah, they met with, we had to go with her because she was a minor. So we went to the judicial meeting on that and they disfellowshipped our daughter. And at the time our son was living at home and our middle daughter was, was still at home. And so that was, that was tough because we could no longer entertain and be hospitable and everything because we had a disfellowship child at home. Um, my, my daughter was so distraught over disfellowship because she, she, she was still a virgin. It was basically just, you know, loose conduct, you know, did some improper touching from, and, you know, and, it, and you've, I'm sure you've heard this from all the stories, you know, how the elders get into every little detail and they met with her numerous times before they actually had the judicial meeting. And so she had to tell the whole story, detail by detail, multiple times, a young 16 year old girl sitting in the room with, you know, three older guys. And the and these elders were like my age, you know, and they were contemporaries of mine, good friends of mine. One of them is still, you know, my best friend. But um, anyways, so she was just getting exasperated by having to tell this story, you know? And so finally when they disfellowshipped her, she, was beyond showing emotion, you know, as far as when she had to tell what she did wrong. And when they disfellowshipped, they told her, well, you really didn't cry until we actually said that you were disfellowshipped. <laughs> That's what they used against her. You know, it's like, really? 
Where's so, the biblical prerequisite for crying? Like you need to cry, like otherwise it's not real. Why, why does that even enter into the equation? Bizarre. Yeah, I know. But she she got home and she says, Dad, you know, that we hear all these talks and it says, if you're repentant, you won't be disfellowshipped. Only unrepentant wrongdoers get disfellowshipped. And I said to her, I go, yeah, that's the biggest lie ever. I said, because you were as repentant as you know how. When I got disfellowshipped the first time in 84, I was super repentant. I was still a virgin, you know, and it's just like, no, it's all about what the, what the elders think. You know, it's, it has nothing to do with, with, you know, well, they always say, well, you got to show, you got to show you're repentant. Well, guess what? If you screw up and you go to the elders like you're supposed to, how much time are you going to have to show that you're repentant? <laughs> it's just a bunch of crap. <laughs> it's the biggest lie. When they, when they say that to this day at the meetings, only unrepentant wrongdoers get this fellowship. I just want to stand up and scream. I get so irritated. <laughs> but um, so she basically does a bunch of research on it and she puts in a letter to appeal it. She follows the rules, says this, I'm writing them a letter. She gives the letter to one of the elders at one of the meetings. And uh, we don't hear nothing, you know, and it's getting close to the following Thursday night to announce it. And I says to the one elder who was a good friend of mine, I said, so I says, yeah, now we got this appeal. And he looks at me, he looked like a deer in the headlights. He goes, appeal, what are you talking about? I said, she gave you guys a letter to appeal it. He goes, that was an appeal letter? I go, yeah. Well, oh, you know, and then he kind of storms off. And so then... They called me up and they said, well, she never used the word appeal. She basically said to reconsider. Oh, dear And I'm Lord. like, what does reconsider mean? I mean, think about it. Why would she write you a letter to reconsider? She knows you're not just going to change your mind. She did the research on appealing, you know. Well, we got to we gotta have a meeting about this. So we go back into another meeting with the three elders and this one brother who's like in charge of the meeting. He's got this letter in his hand and he's like tapping it on his knee and he's like, you know, this isn't an appeal letter. This isn't how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to write this letter like right away because she waited to like the following maybe Tuesday or whatever, you know. And and he's going through this whole song and dance about how it really wasn't an appeal letter. And, you know, hindsight, it was an appeal letter. And hindsight, she should have stuck to her guns. So she, so he's like, so, you know, putting her through the ringer again, saying, you know, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to appeal this? What do you want to do? Or should we just announce it and be over it? And she was so exasperated by that. And she's like, just, just announce it. I just want it to be done with, you know? So, and what's funny is, is her, um her boyfriend at the time, he told his, his relatives and friends who were elders about this whole scenario. And they would call me and they would say, you know, hey, you need to talk to the circuit overseer about this. This isn't being handled right. So I remember at, I was on the phone and I said to my daughter, I said, do you want me to go to the circuit overseer with this? And she goes, no, dad, just, I just want it to be over with. I just want to get reinstated. It shouldn't be a long time and just be done with it. Like, okay. And I remember I even had the phone in my hand and I had the circuit overseer's number ready to dial. And she told me just, and I'm like, okay, I'll leave it up to her. So, um, yeah, so when she got fellowship. And so here, you know, here she is, young 16 year old girl. And she, all she knew is the truth, you know, and that's all she knew. And she totally believed it. And her, her friends and everything were just really tight with it. I felt so bad for her. That was going through her judicial process was way harder than my own personal too, because seeing your child, you know, go through that mental anguish is, and be totally ostracized from all her friends. It's just crazy. But so what happened was, is um, she basically was disfellowshipped for over a year. And um, she basically gave up. She says, you guys won. I'm done. I want nothing to do with it anymore. And then the elders were like coming over and they're like, oh, all she needs to do is write one more letter and we'll reinstate her. I says, nope. I told the elders, you guys won. And I shared the scripture with them. In uh, 2 Corinthians, it said, if a person becomes overly sad that the elders are held accountable, and I said, you guys got to an answer for this. <laughs> when <judgment laughs> comes. I was mad. In fact, one of, the, one of the meetings we had with her to get reinstated, I got so irritated. I got up and walked out. I said to the elders, I said, you know that scripture in Proverbs that says there's a time to leave? I said, I'm leaving. Because I said, it's not going to get pretty. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, 
but yeah, my wife and I still kept coming to meetings and there are other two children. And, but, and I think our son had moved out. So he was in his own apartment at a, at a neighboring town. So he actually changed congregations. But, um, and of course our middle daughter, she was still never baptized at that point in time, but she just kind of still went, went to the meetings. But, um, so yeah, basically what happened was our daughter, we went on a family vacation to Mexico and she met her future husband on this vacation. And so that was all she thought about then. And um, so she ended up moving out when she was 17 and he came and picked her up and took her off to where he lives, which is six and a half hours west of here. And uh, so, yeah, she moved out. I had to write a letter saying it was okay that she was a minor, but uh, she's still married to him 12, 12 years later. So or, hmm. yeah, 13 years, she's been married 13 years. So that worked out okay, but um, of course she's just, she's still in this fellowship. Um, yep. So that's what happened with that scenario, and then um, our son he moved away, and then he started not going to meetings. He was baptized and everything. He actually was a servant in his other congregation. Um, he's he's a very intelligent young man, um, but uh, he ended up doing some research on the um, 607 BCE. That's what woke him up. <laughs> yeah and he was living with another brother and this other brother who he was living with um real nice guy he would he would be in the account area for the regional conventions and, the, and assemblies and he would what woke him up was he would see how they would fudge the numbers to make it look like they needed money Ooh. and, he, and he, he said you know what he said they're always saying oh you know we got a deficit you know we got a deficit and he goes, I would see the numbers. I would see the money in there. And they would still announce they had a deficit. So that's what started his waking up process. So, um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, we, you know, and throughout the years, you know, I would always bring up questions. My wife would always tell me, you know, years ago, you know, oh, you're a borderline apostate, you know, and I'm like, I, I go, I just have questions, you know, what's wrong with having questions. And, but I, you know, I still, believed it you know and and the overlapping generations seem kind of far-fetched but i'm like well yeah the world is getting worse you know and and the whole thing with the earth being a paradise i'm like well it makes sense that it was and that god would still want it to be you know and, and i and i believe in a creator and everything and um so yeah basically when i when i when my part that was for waking up was um through covid you know, when I, when I seen how, um, when they put a screeching halt to field service and, and going to the kingdom hall and the witnesses were kind of caught with their pants down, so to speak, like, okay, now what do we do? We're scrambling, you know, we got to have these meetings and now we can't meet. And, um, and then they use zoom. And I remember thinking, you know, man, Jesus is supposed to be in charge of the congregation. I said, you would think that we, the witnesses would have had their own internal zoom program that we were all um comfortable with and we had practiced zoom programs before covid that would have been to me like hey you know what they're on to something they knew this was going to happen <laughs> instead of using the world so to speak you know to continue having meetings but that was just my thought at the time um, but i never did look at any apostate things literature or videos or anything until you know like well into into the um covid lockdown and then I know I always had questions about the 1975 deal because the witnesses would just make light of it. And a lot of the younger generation have no idea about 1975. I mean, they look at you like, what, 1975? So I started doing some research on 1975. And of course you type in, you know, under YouTube 1975 and there's tons of stuff about it. And then there's actually, you know, audio talks, you know, stay alive till 75 and quotes out of the, you know, kingdom ministry and stuff from back in the late sixties. And I'm like, and of course I lived through 75. I was, you know, probably nine years old, but um, you know, and I remember the congregation expanding and then all of a sudden went back down, you know, and, and things like that. But my parents really didn't make too big of a deal of it. But uh, anyways, so then I realized that when like um, there was a, a talk where brother Morris said, Oh, 1975, that was a few a few brothers from different countries who just blew it out of proportion. I'm like, no, that's a lie. He's lying. lying. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so then once I started in the internet and, um, you know, I, you know, and so I would listen to it because I had to do this all 
secret from my wife because I knew she would be very upset if I listened to any or watched any, you know, YouTube apostate things because witnesses vilify apostates. Like, I mean, it's basically like if you're disfellowship, that's bad. But if you're disfellowship apostate, it's, you're like the devil. You know, yep. I mean, it's just like you're like worse than the devil. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I would always tell my wife, even before I even looked at anything, I'm like, what's the problem? If it's the truth, it'll stand up to the truth. If somebody's telling me that the earth is flat and you could obviously see it's round, that's the truth. So I said, if we have the truth, you would think witnesses would be like, go ahead, investigate all you want. You'll see that it's half truths and things made up and disgruntled disfellowship people, you know, like they always say. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I would I would secretly listen. And so um, for listening, like the Lloyd Evans videos, you know, I mean, that was before all of his mess that he got himself into, but the guy was like real easy to listen to his voice carried real well. And, you know, I work in a noisy factory and I would wear my soundproof earmuffs and I could just hear him. And I'm like, and the thing with Lloyd is, is he's not just taking his own ideas. He's taking stuff from the society's publications and basically just sharing it with you, you know? Um, and I'm like, man, that makes sense. It all makes sense. And it's like, here all these years, I had all these doubts and I thought I was the only one. And I'm thinking, because my wife would be to me, oh, you know, you're letting Satan influ influence you. You're not you're reading your Bible enough and you're not studying enough and you're not praying enough. That's why you have all these doubts. So then I would find out, you know, from all these other people that they thought the same thing. And that's why I was so intrigued by listening to like waking up stories, you know, you know, even ones that were circuit overseers and Bethelites. And I'm like, well, if anybody was spiritual, it was them guys. And look at, you know, they seen it for what it is. So Anyways, and then when my son stopped going to meetings and he, he would share some stuff with me, things, crazy talks that Samuel Hurd gave about women's brain capacity not being as big as a man's. And, um, oh, I think there was one, too, where they, they predicted by the end of the thousand years that there would be no male or female. Everybody would be one sex because there would be no reason to procreate anymore because the earth would be full. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, man, and these guys are the anointed. This is who Jesus picked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are the one channel to the infinite God. It's these guys. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened was, is then, um, so I heard all this stuff from Lloyd and he's explaining, you know, about, you know, all these beliefs and stuff and how they're all wrong. And I couldn't tell anybody because, you know, you can't just go up and say to somebody, hey, I listened to this guy and he said this and that, you know, and it was just my brain was just full of all this knowledge. So I ended up talking with another brother who I've known, you know, for 30 years. And um, he had told me how he had some doubts and how he was even, you know, like taking birthday treats and things like that, you know, and this is all during during lockdown. So I'm thinking, oh, that's my in. I'm going to tell him what I learned. So I call him up one day sneakily. I went to the store. I couldn't call him when my wife was home because usually my wife and I are together like 24 seven. But um, so I told him a few of the things, what, you know, what I learned from the, from Lloyd Evans. So here he goes and turns me into the elders. Oh. All of a sudden I'm getting all these texts from the elders saying, you know, Oh, we need to, we need to meet together. Give me a call and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. So of course this was this was in the middle of of the COVID lockdown and everything. So I end up having a meeting on Zoom with two of the elders in my congregation. So they're asking me all this stuff, and I and I told them and I was truthful and I said, you know, I started investigating in 1975, and and um, this one elder, he was like 90 years old, and he you know he remembered 1975 real well. And he basically told me the truth. He says, no, we did believe in 75. We thought the end was coming and blah, blah, blah. So both the elders were super nice about it. And so my wife thought I was going to get in big trouble. She's like, oh, you're going to be this fellowship. You know, you're going to be this fellowship. You're going to be. And, um, and there wasn't, you know, basically they wanted to hear my side of the story and and, and they dropped it. And so then what happened was, um, so I really, I didn't say anything more to this other other brother about any of it. And so then um, what happened was then like a year later, so the, 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 um, the, the Zoom was, uh, or yeah, at the time we weren't going back to meetings yet, but it was a little bit more relaxed. And so we were with some friends and this one brother was, um, he had been released from prison. So he was one of them guys who, you know, they always say that God lives in prison because that's where you find him. So that's where, where he got baptized in prison and he got out and he was, 
a friend with my my wife's parents. So we're having a few drinks and we're sitting around and he starts talking about the governing body, you know, and things like that. And then, you know, I'm, I'm feeling comfortable. And so, you know, make a long story short, you know, he was telling me how he had read Crisis of Conscience. And I'm like, yeah, so did I, you know, we started talking about that. And then um, different things, you know, and I'm like, wow, this guy's on the same page as me, you know, well, guess what? As soon as we leave, he calls up the elders and says, hey, this guy obviously, you know, is bad news. And so, yeah, the elders are like, call me big time, especially being I already had this so-called apostate check mark in my, in my check box. <laughs> I was so mad, first of all, because um, it uh, he should have came to me first if he had a problem with it, not go right to the elders, you know. But so we end up, uh, I end up meeting with the elders again. And this time we got, I got to meet physically with them. That was, before, that was when the kingdom hall wasn't being used for meetings, but we could still go to the meeting and uh, wear our masks, I think, or whatever. But there was the same two elders. They were real cool with it. Basically, I sweet talked my way out of that because being this other guy was recently out of prison. He had no, you know, no credentials. He was just like, you know, <laughs> and I told him, I said, you know, the guy, guy was saying this, that, and the other thing, you know, and I, um, and so they would, they would say all these things that I said to him and I go, I go, yeah, you know, I, I, I said that, but what was interesting was the whole conversation I had with this ex prisoner guy was in, in the vicinity of my, my in-laws, my wife, they heard the whole conversation and they said, yeah, you didn't, you didn't say anything apostate. So they, they backed me up too. So I got out of that, but they told me to be real careful and they said, you know, you might have a knowledge of all these things, but, um, you know, you have, he, I remember the one elder saying, you have this aura around you that says apostate. So he said, you need to be real careful about what you say. <laughs> so, um, and then I would, and they said, especially with my wife, you know, don't, don't discourage her and things. So, so it, it um, one thing too, that was part of my, my waking up, um, not to backtrack too bad, but like a few years before that. So what, with our children being disfellowshipped, um, I actually, our oldest son, he's not, he just kind of fell away, but our, our middle daughter ended up getting disfellowship because she got pregnant before she was married and put it on Facebook. And so they just, they disfellowshipped her um, basically by certified letter because she wouldn't go to, she wasn't going to meetings or anything like that, which it was funny is because my, my best friend elder called me up and said, uh, you know, yeah, your daughter's going to be announced tonight as being disfellowship. She didn't even know I called and told her. But we always continued our association with our children. I walked both my daughters down the aisle for their weddings. Neither one of them got married in the church. They're both outside. But um, we 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 would eat with them. You know, we have grandchildren with them. So we didn't follow any of them rules. And what happened was, is, is our, our daughter that lives six and a half hours away, her and her family and her husband came to visit us. And we went boating. And then we went to a restaurant on the water and we're at this outdoor restaurant where everybody's sitting outside and lo and behold there's this other couple who are witnesses there and they're both pioneers and they're all hoity-toity and um so they turn turn me into the elders for eating with my disfellowship children oh. I, I had to go to the elders about that you know and i told them i said and i used the technicality i said we were on picnic tables i said we were on one picnic table with our grandchildren our disfellowship children were on another pit the table. They just happened to be close to each other. So technically we weren't eating with them. So they're like, well, I don't think you understand what it means not to associate with your disfellowship children. And I says, no, I, I know what it means. I said, but when they're going to travel six and a half hours and we're going to go out to eat and we, and our grandchildren are too young that they, you know, they wanted to be with their parents. I said, that's what we're going to do. Well, then they wanted to meet with me a second time. And I'm like, no, I said, I already know. I know the scriptures that you're going to show me. And I was just real, I was real blunt with them when I could tell the elder was like, okay, yeah, we're going to just drop it. But I remember leaving there and thinking, you know, you know, it's a cult when you have to explain to other guys that you're eating with your children. I mean, really? <laughs> yeah. They might poison you with some ideas. We need to keep the information so secure that it's all about control. Yeah. 
Yep. And so um, I remember my son, he would he would read the um, uh, Shepherd the Flock book and then he would tell me, he'd be like, Dad, he goes, you know, you can't just get you can't get in trouble for associating with your disabled children as long as you don't talk about spiritual things, you know, and that's the technicality in it. But you can't have any privileges. And I'm like, well, that's fine. I don't want any privileges because I don't want I don't want that because I'd rather be with my children, you know. And uh, so, yeah, that was a crazy thing. And then another time, like we were we were at the county fair and our daughter was working in one of the stands who's this fellowship. And we went to take her, her baby daughter and another brother seen us conversing with our daughter to get the child. And he turned me into the elders and then the elders want to talk to me about that. And I'm just like, what's up with these guys? Why don't they come to me? Why do they go to the elders right away? You know, and I could, I could tell them, but cowardice yeah. it's quick yeah. tattle make, makes me look good. Virtue signaling in the worst way. Yeah. And it was interesting um, when our, uh, our son, one of the, one of the, when we came back to the, our congregation that we've been in forever, we were in a different congregation. And so then they, you know, they give you a letter, they have a letter about you, you know, so when you change congregations, so in the letter, apparently it said that, um, oh, that, you know, Harry associates with his disfellowship children, they said in the letter. And so my friend who's an elder read the letter. And so then he, he thought that our son, our oldest son was this fellowship. And he, he says to me, he goes, you know, he said, if, if you're associating with your son and he's this fellowship, he says, I can no longer be your friend. And I'm like, well, number one, he's not this fellowship. He just fell away. So then it was okay. And I didn't even bring up our daughters. They, you know, our best friends, they don't know that we do anything. We've kept that on the down low, you know, but um I told my wife, I go, well, if you ever want to not be friends with these people, just tell them to hang out with your fellowship children. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's just crazy stuff like that, you know, but uh, yeah. So yeah, I guess the, the waking up part, you know, the 607 part. Yeah, that I, I understand. There is a question from readers in 2011 where the Watchtower addresses that. And they basically say, what, it depends upon what information that you choose to believe, you know, um, so, I mean, that's not like a deal breaker for me. I think the deal breaker really is, is if I'm going to really take the truth seriously, I have to actually believe that all this stuff is going to happen. And I remember saying, you know, saying to my wife, I go, so I'm supposed to go out door to door, try to convince people to become Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, when my own family and my own grandchildren are going to get destroyed at Armageddon because they're not witnesses. I said, I just, I can't wrap my mind around that, that, that God would do that. And then my wife's like, well, Jehovah's going to make sure that everything is wonderful in the paradise. You know, none of that's going to bother you. And I'm just like, ah, I said, so we're going to forget that we ever had children, you know, or grandchildren. I mean, that's going to be totally wiped out of our mind. I said, Jehovah's never monkeyed with free will. We all have free will. That's why we're in this mess to begin with, you know? And um, so just things like that, you know, and, and now when you see the, the hypocrisy, you know, well, one thing that was a big waking up and for a lot of people is the Australian Royal Commission. Listening to that, when when Jeffrey Jackson is like, you know, the famous quote, you know, like, oh, that would be presumptuous. But, um, you know, even all the other stuff, like, oh, that's not my expertise. You know, that's not what I do. It's like, dude, you're an elder. You're like the highest up guy. Everything is your expertise, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I would love to just go up to him face to face, man to man and say, how in the world could you just sit there and lie? You know, I mean, it's, it's so obvious to people that I wonder if he even understands how many people he's woken up by his, his lies, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. We have to tell these apparently Bible believing people that lying is wrong. You know, these grown men that, hey, you shouldn't deceive people because God doesn't want that. But apparently it's OK as long as it maintains the organization and doing whatever you can. It doesn't matter how many sins you have to make. As long as the organization looks good, that's OK. It's idolatry. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm hoping the truth eventually comes out. You know, I, I don't know. But um, as far as about all that stuff. And so, you know, I. All these things, you know, I, I can share all this stuff that I learned with my, my children, of course. Of course, I'd be in big trouble for that because that's like a spiritual conversation. But uh, um, yeah, you know, and then 
um, my wife is just like, I don't want to hear any of that apostate stuff. So I, I try not to, to tell her anything, but certain things I'll just throw in, you know, I'll be like, um, you know, now with this stuff in the Netherlands, you know, about the disfellowshipping and um, because my wife is against disfellowshipping, she feels that's wrong, especially now that our children are married, they're not living in a moral lifestyle, you know, they're good people. So she agrees with the, with the, you know, the, the um, things about disfellowshipping, especially young children like that. Um, so I tell her about some of the stuff that's going on in the courts. And I even told her about the dollar amount that, that our um, things have gone, you know, our contributions have gone toward the attorney. She looks at me, she goes, what? I go, yeah, that's, that's, that's how much money it was spent. Um, so yeah, she's not the most zealous person. I mean, she really, you know, doesn't go out in field service. We go to the meetings, she doesn't comment or anything. I'll actually raise my hand and give answers. Um, as long as it doesn't disagree with my personal beliefs, it's, if it's something like, you know, what questions will be considering in the next paragraph, you know, <laughs> stuff like that, you know, I'll kind of just put on a, a, a show that way, but, um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at with that. But I know basically if, if I was disfellowshipped, it would be very hard on our marriage because, you know, everything revolves around friends in the congregation, um, you know, and I just didn't want to, you know, I don't want to make that decision. And I, and I think I've, I've decided in my mind, like, say, if somehow I get caught with this video or anything that um, if the elders want to meet with me, I just won't meet with them. I don't got to answer to them, guys. They're just a couple imperfect guys who think they have some authority over me. And it's like, they don't. If I physically don't, don't meet with them. That's, I think that's my, my choice. You know, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not going to go go to him and have him barrage me with tons of questions. And, yeah. 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 One of the biggest crocs I think is, is imposed on witnesses is this idea that, Oh, you are being controlled and it's okay. It's okay that the governing body is controlling you or these elders. They have zero control over your life. They cannot kick you out of heaven, so to speak. They have, they are just men and they can do absolutely nothing. I mean, they can only affect your, other witnesses and because they're afraid but yeah they have no power and as soon as you remove that you're like oh yeah they can actually touch me it's so freeing yeah yeah and it's funny even even talking in a casual conversation with other friends and now especially with now this thing with um last minute repentance last minute repentance you know mm -hmm. like in the latest latest uh talk or whatever you know we were talking with some friends that we we're out to eat with even on sunday you know, and, I, and I'm not bringing it up because I don't want to be that guy, you know, so they, so they'll they'll bring it up. And so then they're like going through all these th different ones, like through the Bible times, like, oh, are they going to be resurrected? Are they going to be resurrected now? We always thought everybody that died at the flood, they're not going to be resurrected. Now they're going to be resurrected. And then um, and then I go, I said, uh, I think uh, I think Judas, he'll be resurrected. Oh, no, no, Judas. He, I, <laughs> so I said, I go, somebody had to do it. It was prophesied. I said, if Judas didn't do it, somebody else would. So why why be mad at Judas? He had to do it. <laughs> yeah, they have no biblical backing for that. I've seen that. Oh, Judas does. Like, okay, where does it say that in Scripture? It it, it doesn't. You're making things up again. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, another thing too that was keeping me on the down low is is um, you know, my parents. Uh, my mom just died in November. She was 84. My dad's 88, and I knew, I knew that if if I was to leave the truth. Um, using the word truth lightly, but um, mm -hmm. it would be very, very hard on my mom. I was really, really close with my mom. And um, even though she was suffering from dementia, she might have not understood. But I remember having a conversation with her when her mind was still good. And because um, what happened was, is we had our one of our disfellowship children over with the, our granddaughters and my mom and dad were at our house. And they associated with her, um, you know, very nice to her and everything. And, and um, and my mom says to me later, she's, oh, you know, I didn't like that, uh, you know, associating with your with your disfellowship daughter, but we did it. And then I told her, I said, well, mom, I says they're the, I said they're basically taking the scripture in the Bible that means that meant for people who are disrupting the congregation, trying to get others to turn away from the congregation. Yeah, that person you don't want to say a greeting to. I said, but our daughter has nothing to do with going to the meetings. I said she's a good person. And I said, they, and I said, I said, I have no problem with that. And I remember my mom saying, I like what you're saying. I like that. You know, so <laughs> it sounds like it's truthful. Wait a minute. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So, um, 
but yeah, that's, you know, and, and, and then I have a, a sister who's a couple years older than me. She's a witness. Um, she had been inactive for like 20 years, started going back about 10 years ago. And so, um, you know, we'll start drinking and I'll start getting, talking all my apostate stuff, you know, and I'll be real forthright with her. Yeah. She gets kind of upset, but she's all about, um, principles in the Bible, follow the principles, which I'm okay with that. You know, she goes, yeah, all these men's rules, she would say these men's rules, that's, you know, that's what's wrong, you know, where they do it wrong. But so it's, she tends to look at it more in a more balanced view, but, um, yeah, I even shared that scripture. Um, I think it's uh, Deuteronomy eighteen twenty two or whatever that basically says, you know, if you're prophesying and it doesn't come true, and I'm like, man, that just that talks about governing body big time, you know. Yep. And oh, and this other guy too, that uh, this other brother who had turned me in, I'm still friends with them. Like, yeah, I guess I'm a pretty nice guy, <laughs> but uh, I'm not the ex prisoner, but the other one. Um, I, I, I showed him we we're, we we're camping and I showed him in uh, Genesis chapter three, how um, I think it was the whole chapter, how Satan never lied. I said, show me where the lie is here. Show me where Satan lied. We're going through it verse by verse. And I said, uh, cause notice later, later in the chapter, it said, now, now they have, they have become like us knowing good and bad. I said, and that's what Satan said would happen if you eat from the fruit you'll know you'll know you'll be like god knowing good and bad i said so that wasn't a lie even adam didn't die that day so that wasn't a lie i said where's the lie and he looks at me like you know he had that aha moment he's like how come nobody else knows about this (laughs) yeah it's so that's what kills me with so much of that like according to their when you take their theology into it like it's it starts to break the bible uh because the new testament's very clear like eve was deceived um, but you know, from from the Christian perspective, it's death is spiritual death. Uh, and in Ephesians 2, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. I mean, he's not talking to dead people. He's talking to people who are alive. And the idea that is, yeah, it's Adam and Eve are dying spiritually that day. But from the witness perspective, they're not. He's Satan isn't lying. He's telling the truth. And yeah. so it, it starts to break the Bible. But from their perspective, it doesn't matter because there is no spiritual death. They're more concerned with uh physical death and the entire religion is all about the physical. It's not about the spiritual. Yep. Yeah. And then another thing too is, so I'll, I'll have different things like in the, in co- and I'm like, I gotta be careful. Like when I comment in the watchtower, because I'll want to interject maybe with some kind of thing that I, that I learned, but I had the perfect opportunity a couple of months ago, we had a watchtower study about um, how during the thousand years that some of the 144,000, will provide help and direction in studying with all these newly resurrected ones, okay? Um, and physically, they won't be here, but angelic direction and everything. Well, previous to that, I did some research on how many people have lived and died on since the earth you know, has been around. And the estimates, and it's even in the reasoning from the scriptures book, about 10 billion people, okay? So what I did is I, I did the math and... Um, you know, just throwing out numbers there, you know, basically a thousand years. And I figured out how many people would have to be resurrected on average each day for the thousand years. And it's 300,000 people a day would have to be resurrected. And, you know, you're going to have eight and a half million so-called witnesses that are going to be survived to be able to study with these people and teach them the truth. So what I did is when we had that watchtower study, I raised, I raised my hand and I said, yeah, we're going to need angel direction because it comes out to about 300,000 people a day for a thousand years every day. <laughs> and I was waiting for some kind of comment afterwards, but nobody really said anything. <laughs> and, and every day that Armageddon doesn't come, that number goes higher and higher. And I think it's way more than 10 billion have, have died since then, but that's, you know, potato, yeah. potato. It doesn't matter what's, once you really pull all these things out, it starts to just collapse in on itself uh, yeah. because it's, 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 you know, it's tied together with Elmer's glue and scotch tape. It's, you just take certain parts that you liked and you built a religion out of it. And eventually it's not going to make sense. Right. Yeah. And even like we, um we do a, a daily text thing where we read the examining the scriptures daily, the text, and then we do like a, a group text, you know, where you send like a, a little tidbit that you can encourage you or whatever to the group and we have we only have like another couple on it and me and my wife and so the other day the text was about in the paradise how 
if you basically don't agree with what you're being taught, Jehovah's going to kill you, you know? And, and so I, I commented, my little comment on that was like, there will be death in paradise. Because <laughs> everybody's like, yeah, once paradise comes, there'll be no more death. And I go, guess what? If your great uncle Joel gets resurrected and he said, this is a bunch of malarkey, poof, he's gone. You know? Yeah, it's one of the I've never got that. How can they say for the thousand years you're that's that retesting? And if you don't test, then you're annihilated. You die. You truly die. Like that's the death. There's no resurrection. Like that's permanent, permanent death. Yeah. And yet they say there's no death in this paradise. Well, wait a minute. What, what's happening there? If anything, the death we face now is not real death because you're gonna get resurrected. So what are we talking about here? Yeah. Yeah, and I mentioned to a sister at the Kingdom Hall one day after the meeting, kind of threw in that scripture in Romans where it says the wages of sin is death. I said, so why why are all these people dying again? They already, you know, paid for their sin by dying. She goes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh man, I could rant about this for hours, but it just, it's almost in every doctrine they have, no matter what it is, it's going to collapse in on itself eventually. There's always going to be one scripture to say, hey, that can't be right because of this. And that's one reason I find the Bible, Bible so fascinating. It's almost like God was going, hey, I know the witnesses are going to be a thing. I know these people are going to be a thing one day. And I'm going to purposely put this verse in here just to tear down that one doctrine they have. There's always one, which I find uh, amazing. But it, it never ceases to amaze me. Yeah, that what you were saying earlier, this concept of God's going to destroy me if I don't agree with these men. And I think more people that are like either trying to witness to witnesses or people like you that are like in and out, we really need to keep in our heads. I am doing everything because these nine men say so. Everything is because they say so. The I can't read the Bible without their approval. And it starts to be, wait a minute, is this for God or is it for them? And it really is for them. It's for these leaders. God has nothing to do with it. Yep, it's... Yeah, I, I don't know in your experience, but it just seems like um, a lot of people are, you know, waking up, it, you know, it, it being uh, PIMO, you know, it would be nice, like you say, uh, you know, if if you could identify other PIMOs and get together, you know, but it's kind of one of them things, which I've learned from experience, when you think maybe you have an in to say something, the next thing you know, you're, you know, the elders are pestering you, you know, so. Yeah, uh, it's. It's difficult because when people are leaving, there is the bonus of kind of going nuclear with it where everyone knows that you're out um, because you're an easy magnet to the people saying, hey, I'm out too. Like, I'm going to contact you. But mm -hmm. yeah, that slow fading is like, you never know. Uh, while it protects you and you don't have to face spill shipping and, you know, hey, how dare you have dinner with your kids? Did you eat pie with your grandchild? That's terrible. That's such an evil thing. No, yeah. but it, it's, you feel me here. I mean, that's what cults do, and that's why they're so damaging and dangerous is because of what it does to you mentally, and not just while you're in, but years after of how do I socialize? How do I talk to these people? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no easy answer, unfortunately. Yep. Oh, one one thing, too, if, if, I continue, if I end this without saying it, I'll regret it. So um, another Brother Let story was... So when um, my wife and I were both disfellowshipped and then we had our, our my, my basically my parents' first grandson, my mom wanted to see her grandson. And so Brother Lett was the circuit overseer. And so she met with him and said, I want to see my grandson, but my son and daughter-in-law are disfellowship. How can I go about doing this? And his answer to my mom is he said to her, when they can drive up in the driveway and open the door and your grandson can walk out to you, that's when you can see him. And my mom said, I cried to him. And I said, I don't know if I could wait that long. <laughs> so it just kind of shows the love that brother let has for children, you know, little enemies of God. Yeah. I, I remember my mom telling me that story and I'm just like, you gotta be kidding. He really said that. She goes, yep. When he can walk to you, then you can see him. <laughs> I, I, he was always one of my favorites uh, in all the wrong ways, but that yeah. just makes him even more my favorite. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so where are you like uh, mentally now? Are you, you think you're healthy or are you still dealing with a lot of stuff? I mean, you've, how long has it been since you had that like waking up moment? How many years or months has it been? Yeah, I would say probably like 2020. So about four years where I've been pretty much devouring any, YouTube, you know, stories. I just love listening to the stories, the waking up stories through various ones. Uh, 
um, yeah, so any chance I get, um, but you know, and, and, and I still, I still go to the meetings with my wife. Um, I avoid field service as much as possible. Uh, I, I haven't physically gone. Well, actually when we did the memorial invitation, I think I left the invitation one, but that's about it. And now with not having to count hours or something, you know, I just, it's, it's great because, um, the brother who's um, in charge of our service group, you know, he'll text me and be like, well, did you have any, any ministry? And I'll just send them like a thumbs up, you know, <laughs> just to stay regular. But I told him, I says, you know what? I said, if I go to a public meeting and I answer, I says, that's given a witness, right? Well, yeah, if you want to count it that way, I said, okay, then yeah, that's my thumbs up for the month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But, so, uh, well, it's good because I know a lot of people when they leave, there's there's a lot of anguish. Um, I, I think it's probably a little easier for you because your kids are out. Um, uh, obviously, your wife is still in, which makes it, which is you know obviously still bad. Uh, but she seems um, possibly able to wake up. Like there's not a oh no, witnesses are 100 percent the truth. Like there is at least some admittance that hey, this is I don't agree with this and I don't agree with that. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's wiggle room to work with there. Um, and hopefully she, no one knows what's going to wake up somebody. It could be something that you never that never bothered you that's going to bother her. Uh, and right. it just depends. But um, so where are you? Well, where are you spiritually now? Like, I mean, obviously the witnesses aren't the truth, but um, like, what's your what what where's your worldview now? Yeah, well, you know, like I know some that fall away are like, oh, they, they're they atheists, they don't longer believe in God, blah, blah, blah. But no, I, I do believe in a creator. Um, I mean, obviously, when you look around, you see creation. I mean, there was some intelligence. I mean, even if you believe in evolution, it still had to come from somewhere. Um, but as far as the best way to predict the future is to look at the past. And so I, you know, I don't, um, I don't see these events happening like what witnesses predict you know peace and security you know the government's turning against every religion but but witnesses you know i mean and granted now if that happens according to that latest understanding and i'm like okay well i guess witness are right all along sign me up and i can live forever but <laughs> in the meantime i got to stand up for what i i personally believe in and so I have a heart, to, you know, even though I go to meetings and I listen to all this crap and I go to the convention and I got to go, you know, in, in the regional coming up this, this spring and I got to sit three days through all that. And I just like, uh, I'm just doing it to keep peace in the family. And, you know, I, you know, like I said, I told my wife, cause she, every time that any time apostate stuff comes up and she gets angry with me. And I'll be like, really? Because you'll bring up like, oh, you know, why are we even married and this and that? And I go, I go, that's what's going to break our marriage after 37 years, all the stuff that we've been through. And religion is going to be the thing that causes it to end, you know, but that kind of stuff, you know, that's kind of my, my dilemma is just um, keeping peace in the family. I mean, I, we, we have friends that we go camping with everybody's witnesses. We don't have, we don't have a non-witness social life. Mm. You know, I mean, we live in a nice neighborhood. We'll get together with the neighbors, maybe have some drinks with them, play cornhole and stuff. But I mean, we don't have them over for for a meal or anything like that. Um, you know, other than, you know, the only non-witness association we have would be with our, our children, you know, and our grandchildren. Um, so, yeah, as far as, you know, when, when, when my mom died and they talk about the resurrection, you know, and I'm thinking, man, that would be great. But I I just like... If it happens, great, but I just can't base my life on that, you know. And when my mom was going through her problems and and she says to me, she goes, Do you have did you ever think you'd have to experience us growing old? Mm -hmm. And I told her no. And I said, I said, Mom, you've been lied to all these years. She goes, What do you mean? I says, You were told you were never gonna grow old and die. I says, and now you're, you know, you know, you're you're dying. Mm -hmm. and, and she'd be like, Yeah, yeah, you know, well you know, it's just, it's just is what it is. And, um, so stuff like that, when I, you know, it, it, it angers me, it, it angers me in a way that I wish my, you know, I mean, now I'm Joe factory worker. I mean, we do okay. I make made the best of it, but I wished that I would have had the opportunity to not look at the future as doom and gloom and be like, you know what, I need to find something that I like, make money at it and enjoy life. You know, not just working at at factories, to, just 
just to work until the end comes. You know, that, that part of stuff. And then they even told the elders that when they met with me. And they actually apologized to me. They said, you know, we raised our children the same way, that the end was going to come, and it never did. And um, so, yeah, because there's like a there's like a brother who, who came in the truth later in life, and he's a chiropractor. So he's a regular pioneer. He gets to go to Bethel. He cracks the backs of all the governing body members. They have a special apartment for him at Warwick because he comes there. And he can do all this stuff for him. And then he comes back and he brags like, oh, you know, does all this name dropping. And he knows all this inside information about what goes on at Bethel, you know, and everybody just worships the ground he walks on. And he's a chiropractor. He makes big bucks at it. And I said to these elders, I said, you know what? What if I would have wanted to been a chiropractor when I got out of school? I said, I would, it would have been frowned upon. I would have been, uh, would have been unsuitable association because I was pursuing, you know, a career that had nothing to do with, with, you know, living in paradise. And they're like, you're absolutely right. I said, now this guy can come into truth later. And now the society is using him for all he's worth. And, and he, you know, yeah, it's just stuff like that irritates me. <laughs> uh, no wonder. It, I think they've shot themselves in the foot with that though. Uh, like, right. There was a, uh, a call for lawyers recently, like quick, anyone have any law degree or has anyone <laughs> yeah. passed the bar? Like help, help. It's like, Oh, what happened? Did you tell everybody that they weren't allowed to go to school, get an advanced degree because you're pretty much the only faith that does that. Like Mormons don't have that issue. You know, the Chris, Christendom doesn't have that issue. I personally know people who are lawyers and I mean, and they're Christians and they, and no one cares. It's like, well, that's your job. That's your calling. Go for it. But with witnesses, it's, I mean, it's sad. I mean, it's, it's not something to laugh at. It's something to go, you've ruined these people's lives when you uh, like either you yourself or other people, you know, are really getting older and it's like, okay, it's time for me to pass. I'm going to give away, oh, I, I have nothing. I can't give away anything to my kids. I certainly can't give anything anything away to the the organization. I have nothing. And so the or if the organization was smart, they would have said, hey, let's invest in these people. Let them go and make a lot of money. And when they pass away, they'll probably leave a lot of it with the org. But they didn't even think that far ahead because, again, Armageddon's coming any day. So you have to pick your, what do we do? Is the end coming or is it coming later and we can take money that way? And it just shows you the disorganization amongst God's organization. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of where where I'm at. I mean, I guess I'll just live each day and, and kind of watch everything play out. Um, you know, I remember there was a, I was out in service with a brother. He's a circuit overseer now. And, and he asked me, he goes, so what, what things are you looking forward to in paradise? You know? And I says to him, I go, I'm just looking forward to my questions being answered. <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you mean? And I said a few things, you know, he goes, oh, that's interesting. You know? <laughs> and I remember yeah. years, years ago, we had a book study and the very first question in the first paragraph of the book was if you could meet Jehovah, what question would you ask him? So everybody, you know, everybody in the book study got the comment on what their question was. And, uh, and my question was, I said, I would ask Jehovah where he came from. <laughs> and the brother conducting just looked at me like, huh? I go, yeah, that's the question nobody can answer. I said, so if I'm going to give one question to ask God, that's what I'm going to ask. <laughs> Witnesses claim to be this great, oh, they're these great Bible students, and they, and it's all so, it, you know, it's a, it's an ocean wide, and it's a, not even an inch deep, you know, it's a millimeter deep. They think that they've got this rich Bible understanding, but all of it is just terrible, it, and some of it's childish, and yet it's, it's presented like it's the scholarly level, not, you know, oh, have you read this Watchtower? Like, this is for, like, a first grader. Are you kidding me now? And yeah. so even like questions like that, like I could take that to you know, people I know who are you know, big Bible guys and they'd be able to answer it. And, and it's, it kills me that w it, w no matter what the subject is, witnesses have such a kind of like an immaturity with it. And not, not like a, a purposeful one, but an accidental one just because you've been taught, but you think, oh, I'm awesome. It's like being really good at T-ball and then an MLB player comes up and goes, oh, do you want to play? And they think that they're experts. It's like, no, you're you're a toddler level here. And this isn't really the sport, but you've been taught that it is. Yeah. Yeah. And what irritates me is when when you hear talks and then they quote the watchtower 
like it's gospel. You know, well, the yeah. Watchtower said, quote, blah, 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 from the Watchtower. And I'm thinking, you might as well say that my 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 friend Joe said this, quote. You know, I mean, it's, it, it has no substance whatsoever. And I remember one of them moments where my, my wife and I looked at each other like, what is he talking about? And it was a 2020 regional convention when they had the the whole convention, you know, on, on the internet, we, we couldn't meet together. And Brother Lett gave a talk about resurrection. And um, nobody's really addressed this as far as any on, the, on YouTube videos, which I'm surprised they didn't tear it apart. But one of the things he said is, apparently, according to the Watchtower, you know, or whatever, and he's like, in the, when a person is resurrected, the very first thought that they'll have is what happened at when what caused their death. And he used the illustration of the guards who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. And the heat was so hot that it burned those guards. Now imagine, now brother, let's like, now imagine when them, when them guards are resurrected and they're going to remember that, that, that heat that burned them up, that's going to be the first thought that they have when they get resurrected. My wife and I looked at each other like, what is he talking about? Where is that in the Bible? Can it's you imagine not. a person getting in a head on collision or, or, or anything the worst possible memory that you could possibly have. And that's what you're going to remember when you're resurrected. The very first thought, Ooh, that's real nice. I, I, I haven't heard yeah. that before. And now I'm flabbergasted. Yeah. Nowhere is that in the Bible. He's just, he's just making it up as yeah. he goes along. Yeah. And it's unfortunately, it's like you said, it's seen as gospel. Like, Oh, this is, this is like God speaking pretty much. I mean, yeah. as they said recently, the vo the governing body can be likened to the voice of Jesus. So, yeah. well, wow. I mean, Jesus is saying this. He's not. Jesus did speak, and we have an entire book on what he said, and none of that is in there. It just yeah. shows that they are inventing a religion, just going yeah. with the motions of, of you know, they're playing pretend. And that, yeah. and sadly enough, that's what it is. But I used to think like, oh, maybe they don't know. Maybe, maybe they are just misled. But no, depravity knows no ends. They know something's wrong and they don't care. They have, God has given them over to a depraved mind and this is the result. Yep. Yeah, well, recent meeting, one of the older sisters commented and basically said, you know, if it's in the watchtower, it's like it's from the Bible. It's from uh -huh. Jehovah himself. And she made that comment and everybody just nodded their head in agreement. And, you know, well, thank you, sister so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. I went up to her after the meeting and I said, you know what? I said, I have to disagree with that comment. What do you mean? I said, there's been tons and tons of mistakes in the watchtower. And I said, and Jehovah doesn't make mistakes. So I said, well, if you're saying that if it's in a watchtower, it's from Jehovah. I said, I have to disagree with that. Well, well, it's, it's guided by the Bible. I says, yeah, maybe, maybe it is. But I said, it's not coming from Jehovah. <laughs> I just couldn't go. I couldn't go to bed that night knowing that she said that comment and not me not saying something. <laughs> yeah. And I, th I think that's where this group is heading. It's so they, they have gotten so far away from scripture. I mean, you have to, because you know, once you read the Bible and compare it to what they teach, you're like, wait a minute, something may right here. This is way off. I know several ex witnesses who all they did was read the gospels and went, huh? Well, I don't think it should be a witness anymore because <laughs> this is not the same. This is not the Jesus I was led to believe in. This is not the same good news. None of this is correct. And unfortunately, yeah. but that's where they are, is they have to put the attention on the Watchtower magazines because that's where the religion is coming from. It's not coming from Scripture. And, of course, they'll quote a verse here and there, and it, of course, has nothing to do with the, the topic at hand. I mean, But it's I mean, sometimes they take just a few words they like, and that's it. But this is where this faith is headed. It is just strictly what the governing body is saying, what their magazine says. And I do think it many years ago was more... Oh, it's, heavy quotations here, Bible-based, but now it's gotten so far away from that. And it would be interesting to see the next 10 years, if it even survives that long, how far they're going to go off the rails. Right. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. see. I don't, the, the rate of which people are leaving is, has this kind of snowballing effect where like, you know, you have left, but Maybe 10, 15 years ago, you would have kept completely silent about it. Maybe your kids were still in. But now that, okay, well, my kids are out, so maybe I can be more vocal. And But now one of their friends is out. They can be more vocal. The The social uh, availability is there now where it wasn't there before. And that just keeps cascading to, oh, I can leave because I don't have just one friend. I have three friends. I don't have zero family. I have two family. And that just keeps going and going and going. And eventually you're going to be 
that that anchor for somebody else. And eventually they're going to lose millions of people and it's just going to keep going and going. And they are, as far as age, they're very, very top heavy. So, you know, 20 years from now, unfortunately, a lot of baby boomers are going to be dying off and the witnesses are going to lose half half of their members. I mean, it's they're going to be 4 million members 20 years from now. That's just, that's just true. They have a terrible retention rate. They're not getting anybody to join. So that's just the reality of it. And hopefully we can speed that up and uh, create a, a safe place for people once they leave and go, okay, well, not all hope is lost. Um, God's not angry with me. You know, it's, you know, Jesus still does exist, even though they lied to me. Um, and that's my angle anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about the numbers going down, like in the city that we live in, we, um, we used to have like a big congregation, like 150, 160 publishers. Then it got so big that they, they made two congregations out of it. And now since, um, it's probably been six years ago or so they went back down to one congregation. And, um, now when you go to the kingdom hall, there's like, there's hardly anybody there. And it's a, it's a huge kingdom hall. And it's just funny because, they had to take a bunch of the chairs and just stack them up in the back room, you know, <laughs> all stacked up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you go there and it's just like, it's just not like it used to be. It's not at all. You know, it's like a lot of people say, this isn't the religion that I was raised in. And I mean, and, and that's, that's so true. You know, you just don't have that, that closeness anymore. You don't have that, that form and fuzzy family feeling, you know, it's just like, my, you know, my wife will be like, oh, let's just, let's just zoom the meeting tonight. And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine with that. You ain't gonna, you know, ain't gonna hurt my feelings. And then the, the, like last week, she's like, she goes, well, I, I'm just gonna zoom the meeting tonight. She goes, you can go by yourself. And I'm like, no, I'm not going without you. There's no way. I, I told her, I go, I'm the borderline apostate. So yeah, I'm not gonna go without you. I think they're getting rid of Zoom. That's what I heard. They're they're going to shut down all Zoom meetings because, uh, you know, obviously people aren't showing up. So uh, we'll see how That'd true be that interesting. is. Yeah. yeah, we did like, you know, 40, 50 people on Zoom, you know, when we're hooked up, you know, it's crazy. So what would your advice be to people uh, in your, in a similar situation as yours? Um, As far as the waking up or, or. It's just how to deal with life, you know, like waking up, dealing with uh, the day to day. Well, I think if a, if a person is in as similar situation as me. Um, I guess, you know, just be careful of who you, who you say things to, you know, if you don't want to get in trouble. Um, but as far as the person, um, you know, I, my, my theory is everybody does what they need to do to be happy, you know, and, or what, the, what, you know, people, when you, when you talk to them, well, I don't have time for this and I don't have time for that. Well, if you really want to do it, you'll have time for it, you know? And so um, staying, staying like a, um a kool-aid drinker witness you know wasn't wasn't making me happy now granted am i happy now i you know it, it's i'm kind of in between like okay well i go to meetings but yet i'm not totally worldly and then it's like i always have it hanging over my head like okay if my wife finds out about this the crap's gonna hit the fan and then I'm going to have to deal with a bunch of crap. And, you know, I'm 59 years old. Do I want to have to start over, so to speak? I would have no problem making friends. That's not my issue. You know, I, I think I could, you know, if I left if I left the truth, so to speak, I mean, I could probably join a dart league, a bowling league or whatever. And I'd have, I'd have friends. I'd have friends from work, you know, or whatever. Um, but I think my wife would be a little more difficult, you know, for her. Um, she's not quite as outgoing as me, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing, you know. You're watching events unfold, um, you know, and I, and I watch them to see, okay, is this is this a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, or or is it getting us further away from what what the thing is? And you know, and, and like you said, just watching how the society from the governing body, how things are going to just change to keep up with what's going on you know we're really hoping this disfellowshipping shunning thing they're going to lighten up the the strictness on that and it's going to be tough because you know they have so much invested in it but yeah yeah it's a tough position for sure i mean i don't know what's if i, if I can give a great advice because i'm not in your situation so i don't want to you know i don't you know, don't take advice from people who haven't uh, lived lived through what you've lived through 
but as far as kind of giving you, I guess, your mind some peace, yeah, I, I don't get my uh, eschatology from the newspaper. I kind of don't care what's going to happen, you know, in the future, uh, because no one knows. Uh, only God knows. You know, God has mm -hmm. it all planned out of how it's it's going to shake out. And the and Revelation is such heavy interpretation. It starts to come down to wait. Is that really what the Bible says, or someone's just saying that's what it says? So I tend to stay away from that. Not completely. I always keep an, an eye out. Like, oh, you know, is are the, we getting six 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 tattooed on us somehow? Like, <laughs> maybe I should pay attention to that, even though I think six 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 is Nero. But that's a whole other conversation. But um, instead of kind of looking forward, I I look back and say, wow, well, like you said, like, hey, where did we come from? Um, yeah, who is who is Jesus? What did he do? Uh, yeah. that's kind of where my, my focus has always been. And it's also on the present is saying, Hey, I, I know what has happened in the past and I know what's happening now. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I'm not going to really pay much attention to it because I don't know. And the more I stress out about that, the more it's just going to have that circling effect, that death circle of it's just going and going and going. And it's just going to make me more and more unhappy because I'm going to fear about the future. It's like, but you can't change it. Like God's got it. I'm going to focus on the now, what I can do to improve myself, what I can do to uh, learn what truth is. I mean, learn more about God uh, and then how to rectify the situations in my life. So uh, that's always my advice to people is just because the watchtower lied to you doesn't mean that Jesus didn't rise from the dead and focus. Right. And if that's true, well, then that has some big ramifications on life. So anyway, uh, do you want to, do you want to add anything before I kind of, because I was going to wrap it up, but do you want to add anything else? Um, no, I just, a thought I had when you were just talking is, um, you know, um, my wife, like if I'll break up anything in front of our other friends that we're pretty close with, like the elder and his wife, and, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say something, you know, I'll have to throw it out. Like, you know, like I do about like a new, the new publications, you know, before, you know, anybody else did and I'll, and I'll just kind of throw it out there. And then, and then this one, the elder's wife, she'll be like, well, you know, you know why, you know, all this stuff because Satan, Satan wants you to to fall away you know and then my wife pipes up she goes oh he doesn't believe in satan <laughs> and so i just was like okay yeah where do we go where we go this you know and uh you know i i personally do i believe in the whole good versus evil and satan and i was like my, my theory is according to witnesses though that satan's got lots of power you know god gave him you know he's in charge of the earth and everything right now and the government's and I, you know, I said to my wife, I go, boy, you think he'd be doing a lot more to keep people, you know, keep keep people from learning the truth. You know, that's how I look at it. It's like, what if we're on our way to the regional convention? Couldn't couldn't Satan grab the steering wheel and steer us into head-on collision, so we don't have any spiritual truth that way? I mean, he's got all kinds of power; he could do that, you know. But why does he why does he allow people to continue to go to? meetings and conventions and and go out in the, in the ministry if satan is 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 in control of everything yeah I, you know, that's that's how i look at it i'm like oh yeah you had to, what did my wife say she's like well satan he just he wants to get you he wants to get you to leave leave jehovah and i'm like so what good does it do for satan i said satan accordingly satan knows what the future is for him just like we all do so i said so what if he gets me to leave the truth, so to speak. Well, then, then, then he'll feel better. Satan will feel better about himself that he succeeded. And I said, and, and he knows his demise after the thousand years. He's going to be done forever. So, who cares? You know, I'm just like, look at the big picture. You know, and that's another thing that bugged me is like, after the thousand years, and all these people that are going to, you know, get ju get judged again and, and get killed again. It's just, I mean, the, that whole scenario of all that stuff just is like, yeah, so he's going to lock up Satan for a thousand years and then let Satan out. And we even had an illustration in one of the watchtowers or whatever, showing the people being influenced by Satan after the thousand years. You know, and everybody, you're going to have a whole group of 20-year-olds. You know, nobody's going to be old. Nobody's going to be young. There's going to be no babies. Everybody's going to be, you know, the, the perfect age. It's just, it's just crazy, crazy stuff. I always find that these groups always demote God, certainly demote Christ, and then they promote Satan to be like this, you know, he's he's the Thanos, like he's the big baddie. And the Bible really doesn't talk about him that much, very, very small amounts. Yeah, he's in the beginning and he's, he's with Jesus tempting him, but uh, he's not mentioned that much. And I think we're 
it's there's this power like this he's almost like an equal to god like there's this this uh dualism that's happening and if you yeah. read scripture that's not god is absolutely sovereign god's in control satan is on a chain and even the god of this world i mean they're just going to manipulate that and say look how big and bad satan is you know it's it's not really no you can you can insult satan if you want I and mean, we know witnesses are like oh we don't do that like yes you can like it's okay <laughs> to mock him you're totally allowed like this is just the adversary against you it's don't give him more power than he actually has god is in control not him well anyway harry this has been fantastic this, this some of the stories you have i almost want to talk to you for, i could talk to you for hours just on Stephen yeah. Lett stuff oh uh, that's great uh, keep it up man um keep on searching keep uh keep on staying sane <laughs> amongst going to the meetings that much uh, I can't imagine how much how difficult that is knowing it's not true and yet having to sit there uh, and listen to that. So um, you have a good community around you that are able to encourage you and say, hey, hang in there, man. It's going to be tough, but um, I'm going to keep praying that your wife gets out because I want her to know the truth as well and to say, hey, we're freeing from this and our entire family can leave and we can start new social groups and got a lot of life left. So, you know, you don't know what the next 10, 20 years is going to bring. And there's going to be new people coming into your life and being friends. You know, you have friends that you don't have any met yet. So definitely, that's definitely going to happen. And just should yeah. be interesting to see how much the watchtower collapses in on itself over the next 10, 20 years as well. Thank you much. Appreciate it. This has been a great talk and God bless. All right. Thank you.